been too long. Uh, I first uh, moved to Taipei in 2008 to, uh, to work on this game at, uh, at this studio. It's a critically important piece of the box art. Uh, I, I used to uh, tease my friends here that, and colleagues that uh, Taiwan was my second favorite uh, country in the world. Uh, Canada, as we can all agree, being number one. <laughs> But uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, don't tell my friends back home. Taiwan, ni hao. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about my friend. It's a, it's a short talk, uh, but I'm going to show you just a, a few of, to introduce myself, a few of the games I've worked on as a designer over the years. Uh, the Simpsons Hit and Run, or a, as we called it internally, GTA for kids. <laughs> A series of uh, 3D action adventure platforming games with Crash Bandicoot. <coughs> uh, the game I moved to Singapore to, to work on, the uh, PvP team based uh, 8 versus 8 hardcore shooter, uh, Ghost Recon Phantoms. And uh, the next gen uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, to be honest, I didn't enjoy working on this game too much. Console games have gotten too big for my taste. You know, hundreds of developers, it's, uh, it's hard to feel one has an impact. I think you're better off working on small mobile games these days. So, the design of fun. Uh, despite the somewhat arrogant title of my presentation, I'm not here to define fun or certainly not to give you a formula for how to access, how to create it. There are many different, uh, different kinds of fun. Uh, what I hope to leave you with today is, is a design tool that I found uh, very useful for getting at the fun of your game as fast as possible in the development process. Um, I'm going to make an arrogant statement, another arrogant statement about games though, which is that people play games for, for one reason, which is to access the enjoyable emotions we feel from playing games. Now the, the kind of emotions that you enjoy is a matter of taste, and there's a, a great variety in those emotions, which has led to the incredible variety in game experiences. We have everything from MOBAs to what might be termed a poetic experience. Uh, some people even enjoy this. I, uh, I felt this almost playing the indie game Gone Home, and, and I liked it. Uh, if you don't believe me, I'm going to play a, a small movie that might bring a, an enjoyable tear to your eye. got a little something in your eye, that one still always gets to me. Uh, 
found a study online, these are some of the other emotions that gamers commonly report experiencing in games. Um, the first one, even, even sometimes bliss, that feeling of, of pure joy. How many of you feel that you've, you've experienced what might be called bliss while playing games? So, a few of you. Um, I, I like Nasha as myself, it's one of my favorites. It's a, it's a Yiddish word that means that the happiness from helping others succeed. So when I play Ghost Recon, I'm the one watching the back lanes, taking out the backstabbers, uh, letting other people, perfectly happy to let other people take the more glamorous roles. Uh, any of you who play League of Legends or Dota 2 know exactly what I mean. That jungler who arrives at the last minute and, uh, and saves your life. <laughs> That's someone who enjoys Nashes. Um, but what I want to talk about today is, uh, you know, no, games, games might be designed for any of these emotional experiences, uh, like Neil was talking about earlier today. I want to talk about two emotions that are common to just about all games. How many of you have ever felt like you wanted to do this to a game controller at one time or another? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a, as a few raised hands. Uh, if you Google search the word frustration, you will get a lot of images like this. It's, it's overwhelmingly portrayed as, as, as a negative, very unpleasant emotion. Uh, how many of you have felt this playing games? Uh, fiero is, is an Italian word that means uh, triumph over adversity. Uh, and, and fiero can be incredibly powerful. People, so strong, people even mistake it for that feel the emotion of bliss sometimes. I was playing, uh, I like to play Texas Hold'em on my, on my phone, Texas Hold'em Poker. I think it's one of the best games ever designed because you cannot win without risking losing. I was playing in this in this high-end tournament once at the end game, heads up against another very annoying player who was continuously taunting me every time I, I folded a hand. And so finally I hit, I hit a flush, five cards all one suit, and I taunted him back, come at me bro. Didn't really expect him to take the bait, uh, but he did. It turns out he also had a flush, which is extremely rare for both players to have, have a flush of the same suit, but with lower cards than me, so, so I won. And that was a particularly intense moment of Fiero for me, especially knowing uh, that he must have thought that he was about to win just, just in that moment before the cards turned over. It's a very particular kind of frustration uh, for him. But doesn't the provision of adversity to triumph over in order to, to, to experience Fiero, doesn't that mean that we're intentionally, deliberately frustrating our players? Right? We place obstacles in front of them that are going to be difficult. Even the most casual games, like Candy Crush, place obstacles between the player and their goal. <coughs> so, this tells us that frustration and fear are like two sides of one coin, as we say in English. And haven't you ever had that experience where you're expressing a lot of frustration playing the game? and some non-gamer in your life asks you, well, maybe you should do something you enjoy. And it's hard to explain why that frustration is actually part of the process of the, of the game that you're enjoying. And it's not only that, that loop of, of challenge and, and fear of the, that we're going after. Uh, if, if you make a really great game, your players may be able to experience what the psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi calls flow, or what gamers might call being in the zone. It's that magical place where the controller seems to disappear. Your sense of time itself is altered. And you feel almost as if you're inside the game. You're not even aware of the controller or, or the space around you. That's what a lot of people are chasing. So this tells us something. This tells us that there is a bad kind of frustration, the kind of people that makes people want to break the controller. But there's also a, a good kind of frustration that people experience as challenge. And so the question I have as a developer is how can we isolate those? How can we get rid of the bad kind of frustration and hone in on that, that challenge that's going to make people enjoy your game? Uh, I use a, a technique from the world of industrial design called the seven stages of, of action. 
uh, as coined by Donald Norman in his, his famous book, uh, Design Book, The Design of Everyday Things. So this is a, a technique for designing anything from a, from a teapot to, to a computer. And with a very small modification is, a, it, it is an excellent uh, technique to be used in game development. But before we get on to the seven stages and what that means, I want to talk about another word he introduced called affordance. Uh, simply put, affordance means that the physicality of things implies their design. Uh, in Singapore, for example, we have 4.5 million highly educated and intelligent people who cannot operate doors. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not a fault of the people. The doors are so badly designed that they felt the need to print a user manual right on the object that, that, that they built, one, one word user manual. And the, the, the manual also lies. Most of these doors are push-pull, even when it says push-pull, so people just walk up and they don't know, don't know what to do. Uh, this is an example of, of, a, of a door with proper affordance. The function is implied by the physicality. You can't fail, you, you, you cannot operate it incorrectly. This, uh, as a game example, this is a paddle boat object uh, from the game, uh, from the uh, game Shrek Forever After that was made here in, in Taiwan at Expo. Because we were making this game for DreamWorks and we learned their process, we, we learned that we had to, before we introduced any new object into their universe, we had to draw a picture of it, send it to them, and it would go through their approval pipeline. This turned out to be a tremendous game design time saver because what we found was that we would draw objects and we would show them to someone else and ask them, what does this do? And if they could tell us, then that was an object with good affordance. If not, we'd go back to the drawing board and we'd draw something else. This uh, was, a, was, was an incredibly efficient way to develop the game because uh, all of the iteration of our objects took place on paper. So the seven stages. Imagine you're reading a book, and the sun has gone down, so now the room is dark. How, what's the process by which you proceed? There's stages which your mind goes through. First, you create a goal. I want to keep reading my book. You, you, you change that goal into an intention. You translate it into an intention. I will make light. You translate that intention into a series of actions, a plan for how you're going to make life. And it's a series of steps. Nothing is ever as simple as just one step. So you're, you might do this subconsciously, but our mind does this every day with all these tasks that we do. So you make this plan. I will get up out of the chair. I will move to the light switch. I will find the light switch. I will activate the light switch. Then you begin to execute those actions. And the world, provides physical, perceptual feedback at every stage. There's the feeling that you're standing, that you're moving through the room, the feeling of the light switch under your hand as you toggle it, the light hitting your eyes. And then there's the feedback. So there's the perception of the light hitting your eyes, or not. Then you go to another stage in your brain of interpreting the feedback. What does that feedback mean? Did the, is there enough light to read by? Did the light go on? Is the light working? Did I turn on the wrong one? And when we stayed in the hotel room, knows the frustration of trying to find the right light switch for, for the right light. Not always as simple as it seems. The goals, intention, planning the actions, doing the actions, perceiving, perception of the state of the world, interpreting that state of the world, and evaluating the outcome in terms of your goal. Same in a game with a virtual world. Imagine you're playing a shooter, and an enemy appears. You form a goal. You're going to kill the enemy. An intention to kill the enemy. Sorry, your goal is to get through the shooter, you change that to an intention. You can work that into a plan. Series of actions that you then have to execute. Oh, I have to select the right weapon. I have to move my character to the right position. I have to aim. I have to press the fire button. And then there's all the feedback that has to happen, the hit reactions on the enemy, the, the health bars. That's why people are always telling you every time you do a play test that your game needs more feedback. Once they've executed the action, they're only halfway through this process. 
how it works. And this is a continual cycle. It doesn't matter whether the world we're talking about the physical real world or a virtual world. And this isn't just design terminology. This is how our brains work. And the reason it's so, it's so useful as a design technique is because it's so easy to take any kind of player feedback, or even your own imagination to playing the game, and determine exactly where the problem lies. Is it a problem with execution in the first stages? Or is it a problem in evaluation and feedback, We're trying to determine am I getting closer to my goal? For example, we were testing our open world uh, GTA for kids game, Simpsons Hit and Run. <laughs> and, and our first play test, we wanted to uh, test the difficulty of the first mission. Our core mechanic was driving from the top to Marge, you get in the car and start, start playing. And so we give the players the goal, so they were starting kind of at stage two. They had to form some tension, a plan, and carry out all the actions. Over like the first three play tests, we couldn't even get them in the mission. Turns out what was happening was they would see these, these shiny gold mirror style coins sparkling, going off in the background, and, and then they'd kind of just be like home where they'd go, ooh, shiny. <laughs> <laughs> back to the backyard to, to get the coins. So they were having trouble because there's so much such a big possibility space, they didn't know how to create that plan of actions, how to do what they're being asked to do. So in this case, just by changing the default camera and reducing the possibility space, we're able to create a simpler environment where they were able to now identify what was the correct step of actions in order to do their intention, which was to play the first mission. This is the classic problem of poor affordance with game doors. A little better these days, but doors that you can't tell which ones are interactive. So the player can have an intention, they want to leave the room, how do you do it? They don't know, there's no visual information telling them which objects are, interact are, are interactive or not. So this is the video game version of that door with poor affordance. Counter example on the feedback side, one of the reasons is why we put enemy, we put health bars on the enemies, right? So that I can see how much damage I'm doing to them with the weapon, so I can get that feedback of how closely I'm progressing to my goal, which is to kill the enemy. When you don't have that feedback, I might be using the wrong weapon and I don't even know it. MOBAs like League of Legends and Dota are an interesting case. Uh, because they tend to do, I think, a, a pretty good job with, with micro-feedback. You know, there's, there's meters for, for the buffs and my powers and shields and, and, and all the things that are going on in the world. Um, but even then, there's so much information, it actually can become kind of overwhelming for the player. And, and Riot certainly understands the importance of that, the importance of feedback. So when you die, there's actually a death log that tells you what's going on, where that damage came from, trying to, trying to communicate with you what happened, although even that can, has its limitations. Um, it's one of the limitations of negative feedback, why when you are doing feedback, you need to be careful about feedback that just tells the player that they've done something wrong. Uh, behavioral psychologists will tell us this as well, that the limitation of, of negative feedback is that it makes us feel bad, but it doesn't inform us as to what the correct action is. Uh, sadly, this is a, a screen I'm all too familiar with. Uh, this may be the next generation of, of game feedback. Uh, in Dota 2 Reborn, Valve is promising an AI director with their bot matches to actually give you strategic advice in these games that are notoriously difficult to learn. People die, they, they don't know why, they don't know what they're doing wrong. That's a, that's a failure in feedback, right? know to operate the game, but they don't know why the other player is stronger than them. Why do people hate how to play screens so much? <laughs> because it's too much information at the wrong time. And both the players and you as developers know exactly what the result of that's going to be. When it comes down to executing the actions, I'm not going to remember the information or in the stages of, the stages of action terminology. I'm going to know what I want to do, I'm not going to be able to convert that into the actual plan. What are the actions to do? I don't remember the controls. 
Uh, I have a theory that maybe this is why the classic uh, adventure games died out. You know, I love this particular game. But with their kind of obtuse puzzles, there was a vast gap between what people wanted to do and what they could figure out how to do. Eventually, your patience would wear thin. Why advent modern adventure games have evolved to a very different style of, of, of puzzles. And so when you get feedback from the player, uh, Norman divides the problems into two categories. He calls it the gulf of execution or the gulf of evaluation. Is, 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 uh, on the one hand, it's everything about planning or executing an action. Everything else is about feedback. And the reason it's such a useful technique is because it's very easy when you get any feedback to first divide it into one of these two categories and then subdivide it. You can actually see very plainly in some of the examples I showed which area is actually causing the difficulty in this normal stages of action, which is how, how the player's mind works. So how does this tie into the emotions they were talking about, the fiero and frustration? Um, and and how, how does this let us separate bad frustration from good frustration, the kind that can lead to the player being in the zone? Um, you might have noticed that I didn't, uh, the one area I didn't give any examples on was executing the actions. This is where the, the process differs from industrial design. In industrial design, we try to make execution as effortless and simple as possible. You know, light switch design has evolved over years to be tactile, simple, toggle switches, very easy to operate. But in games, that's the one difference. Executing the action is your game's core mechanic, your basic skill-based gameplay. In other words, these are the obstacles that you're deliberately putting in front of the player that may result in the kind of frustration that we consider to be a challenge that could lead to Fiero, hopefully even flow. But everything else, everything in the outside areas, that's going to lead to bad frustration. And the most important point to understand is that until you eliminate those layers of bad frustration, the player will not be able to get at the fun part of your game, that kernel that you found in prototyping that was fun. This is why games often start out fun in prototyping, and then you suddenly you find that it can lose its path along the way. Uh, remember affordance? That's why this is so important. When an object has good affordance, it can actually make step two and three, change your goal to, a, to an interpretation and to, an act, to a plan and to, to you're gonna execute on, can make that almost automatic. So you can take your goal this place and automatically convert it into the actions without even thinking about it. Same thing applies with a game object. And like I said, I'm going to repeat myself because the most important point to understand is that any of these elements of bad frustration in the red will block the player from getting at the gameplay. Just like when the Simpsons hit and run, that first screen I showed you, as long as we had too many options for them, we had the camera wrong, too many distractions, we could not even get them to the gameplay. User interface problems are so severe, they will block the player from even being able to get there. So until you solve these, you're not going to be able to get at the fun. Because games, they're kind of like ogres. And ogres are like a well, left track teller. For your information, there's a lot more to ogres than people think. Example? Example. Okay, um, ogres are like onions. They stink? Yes. No. Oh, they make you No. Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hands. No. Layers. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers. You get it. We both have layers. Oh, no, you both have layers. You know, not everybody likes onions. <laughs> and so as long as we had the bad frustration, confusing the player intentions, for example, 
get, get into the core mechanic, that, that gameplay at the center of the onion, was impossible. We had to peel the layers of the onion first. Peel away the layers of bad frustration, so the players can experience that nugget of gameplay that's at the center of your game, and feel like this. Thank you. First off, thanks, off, thanks for the speech. I really enjoyed it. And here's my question. So basically, in tri more traditional puzzle game adventure-like games where you have to collect items and decide what to do with the items, some people would argue that an enjoyment of the game is to look at the items and then prance around the room for about something like two to three minutes, observing your surroundings and then deciding what is the best way to use these items. Some people think this is an actual engage, engaging draw of these sort of puzzle games, and other people think that it's actually an unnecessary frustration of the game. So what is your opinion on this? Uh, I, I agree with people who say that soaking up the atmosphere and enjoying those kinds of games is, is really the enjoyable part. Where it gets frustrating is when those two to three minutes turn into two or three hours. Or in the old days, you know, you'd be looking through FAQs uh, once we finally have the internet. I'm older than the internet, I'm afraid. Um, but this is, if you look at the way the really successful modern invention and puzzle games have evolved, take uh, Telltale Games, fantastic, uh, The Walking Dead, right? They've changed the mechanics so that the puzzles, quote unquote, are hardly puzzles at all. It's really, they've changed the gameplay to be much more about the characters, about the stories, about the dilemmas and the decision making, about soaking up the atmosphere. So I think that really was the enjoyment in those games and the humor. Well, I like those games too. I mean, uh, Neil gave his talk this morning on uh, on Monument Valley as a, as a fantastically fun puzzle game. Okay, so uh, we have time for one more question, and I I want to ask you the next 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 time. Just stand by. Okay. So uh, when we change the computers or laptops, uh, okay. Okay. so one more question. Do we have one more question? Have you had help? Have you had any problems? No. If there's no problem, then we'll just have to stop. Okay, thank you very much.